All right. Um, let me let me touch first on uh, some of the news here uh, in solar this week. And I know I'd asked Tony, um, he's going to talk a bit about his projects with uh, charging stations and the like. But um, in the news, really just one piece of legislative news that I saw, there's a bill going before the Ohio legislature um, about community solar. And it has actually uh, sponsored by a couple of Republicans in the uh, assembly. And I, I got an email or two from folks asking, is this a good thing or a bad thing? And my response is, yeah, probably. You know, I don't know. Um, it, it, the details are pretty sketchy, but um, it looks like it's a pro, it's a um, pilot program. They're they're wanting to authorize up to two thousand megawatts of solar community solar on distressed sites, which apparently means all of the Appalachian counties, since we are apparently considered distressed. Um, which isn't far from accurate, I, I guess. And uh, it, but I think the main thing is it says it allows for, but does not mandate utilities, uh, you know, do community solar. Well, they already can if they want to. Right. It's just that they're not going to. So I don't know if it does anything at all, but it looks like they maybe leave it to the Public Utilities Commission uh, of Ohio, where I guess it gives them the right to, I guess, demand it, but not quite sure. It sounds more like a PR thing than anything, but it might be the nose in the camel's tent. Who knows? You know, we don't have any community solar going on in Ohio, so it might be an opening to that. Um, they don't provide the incentives? Uh, I didn't see any. Um, okay. And, and it looks like they're trying to put it under brownfield issue, but they also uh, left it as distressed, meaning if you're in a uh, region, an impoverished region. Um, so it was, it's felt very, very sketchy at the moment, and it's just proposed. Um, there were two items that I thought were interesting and of note, um, and it, it, it to me indicates where the industry is going, at least on the residential um, uh, platforms, but both Enphase and Solar Edge are announcing their new uh, product lines. And Enphase has announced that the IQ8 series is coming out in December. Okay. And Solar Edge is annou announcing what they're calling their Energy Bank series. And both of these are really geared up towards integrating storage in with their systems and becoming, in the case of Enphase, an AC coupled system, and in the case of uh, Solar Edge, a DC coupled system. But they're doing it as integrated vendor specific packages that will make these things easy to install, um, easy to configure. The Enphase 8, um, it, what, what's unique about that is it'll now operate they say as a microgrid, but basically as an AC coupled system without batteries. So during daylight hours, it will function um, with, without any battery whatsoever. I guess sort of like the old um, uh, Sunny Boy, where they had the one, one plug that you could hook up and operate under daylight hours. Well, this is just basically saying if you hook it in with their, their rebrand or re branding what they had called their Empower Smart Switch. They're rebranding that as the Enphase System Controller. So it's just an auto transformer, you know, to disconnect you a relay from the grid when the grid goes down. And uh, uh, so you would integrate a battery in there, you could integrate a generator, or you could integrate nothing. Um, and then during daylight hours, it would operate. In fact, I, I brought up a, I have a little picture here of, um, let's see here, I'll do the screen share. Uh, this is, this is the picture I wanted. And, and what this is showing you is essentially a whole house um, Enphase system with the array up here in the upper left. 
you go to the combiner box and pretty much any new system that's being installed with Enphase is gonna have this combiner box because that integrates the uh, communication system and it only costs maybe $50 more than the communication system. Then you would hook into your load panel uh, just with your standard uh, AC coupled system or not AC coupled, but your standard load side connection. And then you're going to essentially connect this smart switch between the main and the meter. So it becomes a new point of connection. And here you can integrate in your batteries, any generator, um, it wirelessly communicates with the uh, combiner box in the system there. So this would be a, a um, whole house backup system. If you wanted to do just a critical load panel, this would be the configuration you would go with where you come from the combiner box, then you go to the smart switch. There is a connection point for the sub panel, critical load panel. Uh, the batteries, generator, and then you head into the load side connection. So with the whole house, uh, you're basically connecting the main where the backup sub panel connects in here, um, but it's beyond the main. You know, it, it, it treats the whole main load panel as a sub panel, essentially, when you're doing the whole house system. Um, I wonder, I wonder about this, I guess I can see a couple of problems. Um, if you're bringing a generator in, if you're bringing in your battery backup, if you're bringing in all this, will you, I mean, how much capacity? Well, I guess that's coming into a 200 amp circuit anyway. So I guess it doesn't really matter. I was thinking about with a load side connection, um, how you're, going to be limited with your amps. But most of this, I guess, is coming in through here. I'd have to see if this thing just sort of transfers through and connects over here, or if it does have to connect to a breaker. Um, if it doesn't have to connect to a breaker, that might solve some problems in installations where the service panel doesn't have room for solar. So then suddenly you, this switch becomes the connection point and it no longer becomes an issue. So have to look at that. I'm, I'm not 100% clear on it. I did have this diagram here that I thought would be interesting to look at, which from an installation standpoint, pretty straightforward. The PV uh, from the combiner box just connects in here. It'd be two hots. Uh, and the line, and, and I suspect there's a neutral bus bar or a grounding bus bar in here somewhere. Then the exchange, the exchange is their battery system, what they're calling the battery. The backup load panel or the critical load panel connects in here. It would be your main load panel if you're doing it as 100%. Uh, a generator hooks in here. All of these would just be two hots and, and a neutral. And then you're going either, if it's a critical load panel, you're going to the main from here, or if it's um, a uh, um, the whole house, this would be going to the meter. So it-, it Jay, did you mention at one point that they could do this without the, they're saying they could do this without the battery? Yeah, yeah, that's what they're claiming. They don't need a battery here. Now, if I'm just curious if if they don't need a battery, I just watching my panels from today, and it it went from nineteen thousand to five thousand in, in the course of a couple of minutes, depending on the the cloud cover. I mean, especially if they're trying to to you know power the whole house, is that I mean that kind of fluctuation up and down isn't that going to cause a lot of uh, trouble? Probably, <laughs> I would okay. think. I would think you just better not run your air conditioner, huh? Yeah. Um, you know, again, I think we're dealing with the fact that all these people live in Southern California and uh, okay. they're just not used to the real world of weather. You know, okay. they think rain is an amazing event um, so, <laughs> and, and apocalyptic. <laughs> so um, they, they do integrate the, the standard battery 
for that is a uh, 3.36 kilowatt hour battery, the end phase. You can hook up the three of them together in a unit and it's pretty straightforward. They buy, you know, it just has a little combiner thing. You're just daisy chaining them together. Um, each of those is about 2,600 bucks retail for those battery units. And the um, smart switch is about 15 to $1,700. So when I look at this with those two combined, sort of a minimal materials cost of around $4,000, four to $5,000 for um, basically turning an end phase system into an AC coupled system with, with a small battery bank. Now the battery won't be required apparently with the, um, with the eight, but my guess is they're going to, you're going to want it anyway. That would be my guess just for the reason Don brought up. Um, the solar edge energy bank is um, a, a bigger system. Their, their base battery is 9.7 kilowatt hours. And, um, and you can hook up to eight of these in, in parallel which would make it an 87 kilowatt hour system, which is pretty, pretty substantial. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly commercial grade, I would think, um, more so than any residents I'm, I'm familiar with. Uh, or who knows? I mean, I guess the average consumption is 30 kilowatt hours a day. Um, yeah. So three days of backup power without any input. So I, I think I've got 66 and that's half of the 120, you know, it's a, it's not uh, lithium ion. Yeah. Uh -huh. You must have a pretty much a, a whole room devoted to your batteries, huh? No, just a little, it's uh, 48 batteries. 48 it's batteries. Four, yeah. They're each one weighing what? 75 pounds or so. Well, they're, they're all in a, in a rack. So there's, uh, you know, four, four high. Four, they're all 12 volt batteries, so it's uh, four racks of four, so 16 in a in a stack, and it's just three stacks. Yeah, so close to two tons of batteries sounds like. It's in the it's in the basement. I put it in the basement just because it was <laughs> yes, two tons of batteries. Well, it would eventually be in the basement anyway, you know. Well, good, good point. Yeah, the, I, I was I was hoping to do it voluntarily. Let's put it that way. <laughs> all right. Exactly. Oh, um, with the. Um, with the IQ8, you know, there was rumors before about um, uh, these would be the tandem ones. And I didn't see any evidence of that in their product announcement that you could hook up more than one panel to, to the inverter. Uh, they were listing them as uh, the IQ8, 245 volt amps, the IQ8 plus at 300 volt amps, and then, of course, just to make things easy, the IQ8M, who knows why, 330 volt amps, the IQ8A, 266 volt amps, and the IQ8H is 384 volt amps. So none of those really sound like tandem inverters to me. You know, what would be the Jay, point? Can you explain the concept of tandem inverters, please? Well, there are certain, there are inverters out there that you can, uh, these micro inverters where you can hook up two panels to an inverter. In fact, I think, um, um, was, uh, Bill, was it, was he, he was showing one that hooks up four. Um, mm -hmm. So, so it's sort of like the, the power optimizers where uh, you could hook up two to a single unit for larger systems to save some cost. So, mm -hmm. I mean, okay. one of the advantages of a micro inverter is that every panel acts independently of every other panel. But in many instances, it's not critical. I mean, having groups of two is not gonna really affect anything sure. because of shading and the like. So if you can cut down the cost, say you're installing 500 panels and you can get by with 250 microinverters rather than 500, it's gonna be a substantial savings. So, sure. so that's the plan. But I really thought Enphase was doing that with this IQ8, but um, apparently not. I guess and they decided the, to focus on storage. What was the other one, Jay? It was IQ8, and then what was what was the other one? Oh, you mean as far as other vendors of, of no, microinverters? 
the you did a, the end the end phase IQ8 and then oh solar there's edge. I, IQ8 plus there's uh, oh the solar edge you mean the other solar, solar edge, edge one yeah what was the solar edge one yeah solar edge is not a microinverter system that's a power optimizer system yep yep so that one of course has power optimizers on each panel as the module level power electronics but it has a centralized inverter. And of course the downside with solar edge um, mm -hmm. as opposed to end phase is that there's mm -hmm. one point of failure, you know, one possible point of failure, uh, which is the centralized microinverter. Whereas with, with microinverters, if there are 30 panels, you got 30 inverters. So if one goes bad, only one has gone bad. Mm -hmm. And in recent years, or at least in the recent year, there has been some reliability problems with Solar Edge. I, I haven't really looked at it recently, but there was a lot of discussion online about the Solar Edge inverters going bad, and and they would always replace them. But but you were having to deal with the the outage and and sure. the hassle. So. Um, so that was the news that I saw. Everything else was pretty, pretty stable. So did anybody have anything they wanted to bring up? Yeah, Jay? Uh, and it sort of fits in this, and I'm, I'm just puzzling, um, and I'm not qualified the way probably most of you on this presentation know this stuff, but I don't. Um, if I were to do the conversion for our Chevy Volt, for instance, to turn that into a power source, and hooked it in with the um, the 32 panels we've got on the roof. Um, will that conversion process become a passive way of doing the same thing you're talking about uh, with the AC coming in and the AC going back out, bypassing the batteries? Or does that always need to go from the panels into the batteries of the car in DC and then back out as AC again? Um, no, I think you could you could treat your Chevy Volt, assuming it's like forty eight volts. I'm not sure what what uh, what its nominal voltage is, but you could treat that as just a battery that you're hooking into your system. Um, the problem is your well. I know you've got to use Chevy Volt, right? Um, We're out of probably, warranty already. So. Yeah, the warranty would probably be voided if you did that, um, and. Uh, in fact, the only vehicle, I think, the only electric vehicle out there that's that's already pre-approved for vehicle to grid is the Nissan Leaf. Leaf, yep. Yeah, so so you could hook your Leaf in, but your Chevy Volt, yeah, you just treat that as a battery. You could hook that in, um, I would think, I would think. I mean, yeah, we, Tom, have, we, have a, we have a dying Leaf as well, so I've got 80%. <laughs> 80% of a leaf as well. <laughs> in in Houston, work. people in Houston people were using their F-150 hybrids during the freeze um, mm. in, that, in that capacity. Yeah. Yeah, yeah then it's sort of just a generator, isn't it? Yeah. 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 The, the new the new uh, chef or the the new lightnings, whatever, Ford Lightnings are supposed to do that too, aren't they, Jay? Yeah, that's what they've been claiming. I don't know if yeah. those have been, I don't know that they're on the market yet. But no, um, Not that I'm aware of, no. Yeah, they talk about it. And it seems to me they'll probably have their own proprietary uh, charging station that makes yeah. that happen. It would have to have a, a you know, a, a um, inverter of some sort, you yeah. know, built into yeah. that. So, their deal was, they made a big deal with Sun Run to provide a kind of a proprietary specialized cable to do that, to do that interface. Yeah, I have a lot of hopes for the, um, for the, if it's Ford, right? Ford Lightning? Yeah, Ford Lightning. Yeah, yep. Ford Lightning. yeah. yeah. cause I, I really think that's gonna put macho into the EV world. Yep. You know, it's yep. gonna sort of make it okay for all of the tobacco chewing, you know, um, uh, Trump supporters who who have ridiculed electric vehicles now it will become, you know, a testosterone vehicle. So. Yeah, they they clearly put production in the in the tobacco chewing area. You know, it's down in Kentucky and Tennessee. So yep. there you go. Yeah, although you know, it's funny. I've heard from several different people to recently trying to buy cars and not being able to get any anywhere. Yeah. So yeah. so hey, I'm. Jay. Yeah, back back on um, 
the solar edge discussion. If um, have you all seen the push from Generac in your area, and is that a rebranded solar edge product, or is that their own technology? It seems to me, I, yeah, I've seen the push online, not in my area per se, mm -hmm. and and I think it is a rebrand, but I don't think it's Solar Edge. I think it's it's somebody else. Um, uh, it looks like a DC power optimizer type model, if I understood it correctly, but I'm not quite sure. Yeah, well, I, I'm sure it is, um, you know, a DC with, with some sort of um, DC coupled inverter system. Right. Um, you know, the optimizers are really a matter of, of the panel and how that operates. But my guess is, um, yeah, for some reason, there's, who, who is that battery company that, Iguana, right? Isn't there a, a one called Iguana that's yeah. not, not spelled like the animal, but um, something like that? It seemed, for some reason, I got this vague recollection that that's who they were dealing with. Generac and Iguana. It seems to me I saw some article. I might be wrong. Probably I'm wrong, but um, just seemed to me. But struck me as the deal, sort of like what you were saying, Tony, where somebody goes in, like Ford goes in with some other, these yeah. guys. Generac is a generator company who's basically yeah. saying, okay, we're already in the market of selling backup power. Why don't we diversify into the battery world? Um, oh, speaking of that, on the end phase, one of the other things they're claiming is in this rebranding of the uh, smart switch from an end phase uh, from the M power smart switch to the end phase system controller, it will integrate with every major generator brand out there on the market. So what that means, how they do that, whatever, I don't know, but that was part of their marketing scheme is if you already own a generator, it will probably work with this system. So that's their, so that would mean to me at least that they got to deal with both 120 and 240, you know, as a backup generator somehow. Not sure how they did, do that. Did you guys hear that uh, Briggs and Stratton bought Simplify Battery? Simplify <laughs> is a lithium ion battery manufacturer and Briggs and Stratton has bought them. So, you know, they've got their own battery backup battery, gener or I'm sorry, generators that they sell. So it looks like they're getting into that same place that Generac's trying to get into. Yeah, I think we're starting to see how essentially the residential market specifically is moving towards solar and storage, you know, as a, as a, a first go-to as opposed to, oh, by the way, we can add storage. It's going to be, this is the norm. And it's going to be weird if you don't want some sort of storage integrated into your system. Right. So. Okay. Anybody else have any comments before I throw it over to Tony to speaking? Because this goes right along with our discussion to this point. So Tony uh, was in the class at University of Dayton recently with me, and, and he's got a company. So I thought it would be interesting. Tony, I won't foreshadow it. You just tell us what you're doing. Sure. Let me... Uh... Let me share my screen because pictures are good. Can everybody see this? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So real brief background on me and how this whole thing came about. So I was in Afghanistan in 2014 as an engineer officer, and we were looking for improvised explosive devices, ideally before they went off. Uh, and they were targeting obviously convoys and something like 80% of all convoys rolling around in Afghanistan at the time did nothing else but drop off diesel fuel, diesel fuel for generators for our electricity 24-7, uh, and then also obviously fuel for military vehicles, which are not exactly the most fuel efficient things on the planet. Uh, so this was just like a you know whack-a-mole groundhog day every single day. Um, literally four out of the five convoys did nothing else but drop off fuel, mostly coming from Pakistan. Um, which you can imagine the, the target, target signature of something like that. Um, and that's not a great position to be in, uh, to, to be driving uh, a fuel truck through the mountains of Afghanistan for a variety of reasons. So I was out there kind of sucking in the heat with my guys and, and I thought this was pretty stupid. This is about as stupid as it gets. We've got this giant fusion reactor in the sky and called the sun and we're not using it at all for anything. We're not using it for 
incorporating it into our power uh, and our electricity and nobody was even remotely talking about anything type of of incorporating the solar into electric vehicles so we get back from afghanistan late 2014 so I'm looking around trying to figure out what I want to do with this. I'm pissed off. So I think I'm going to start a solar installation company, just a normal solar installation company. But fortunately for me, um, I linked up with a buddy of mine, uh, Nelson, who at the time was getting his PhD at MIT. So he's a big, he's a big moron. Uh, and he said he thought he could figure out a way to address what was and still is commonly cited as the number one gripe for people not buying electric vehicles and that's the slow charge time and do it in a cost effective way and then also we wanted to continue to kind of push the envelope and work on incorporating renewable energy specifically solar more directly into the charging process because it's it's great it is absolutely better for the environment to and air quality and anything else that anybody has to care about. Um, then if you switch your, your internal combustion engine vehicle for an electric vehicle, but if you're charging that with electrons that are generated by a coal burning power plant, that's suboptimal. Um, we can do a little bit better. Still better than just burning gasoline and releasing it into the air, uh, but we could do a little bit better. So we wanted to incorporate solar into that process. And then the last thing we wanted to do, we saw that there was just going to be this very big chicken and egg problem was and still is today where if you're talking about electric vehicle chargers typically they're prohibitively expensive and there's no real incentive for anyone uh any parking lot restaurant owner apartment complex anybody to buy these expensive ass chargers and put them in their parking lots prior to anyone having an electric vehicle, right? So there's no, I'm gonna go out and buy $100,000 worth of DC fast chargers for my residents and they don't, nobody, cause, then, cause you look out in your parking lot and they're like, well, nobody drives an EV so I don't want it. Well, they don't have an EV because there's no place to charge them, but the, you can't really justify dropping that kind of money. So the other thing that we wanted to try to solve by kind of combining uh, electric vehicle fast charging and solar is the ability to make the, the math pencil out so that you can use this system for solar and storage now. And baked into that would be the, would be the, the charger if and when the kind of the, the fleets come online. So the other thing that we were looking at is on the commercial side, because we thought that that's where the wave would hit first. On the commercial charging side, they're kind of two extremes right now. On, on one end, you've got cheap, cheap, there could be a thousand dollars, cheap uh, glorified extension cords that are like AC chargers, three, five, seven kilowatt dinky little AC chargers for your electric vehicle. And on the completely opposite end, you've got on the DC fast charger, supercharger side, you've got 150 plus thousand dollar products uh, for supercharging. And there's not a whole lot in the middle. And when we were looking at kind of doing the analysis of the market, we realized, well, the AC side won't work. One, just because it's slow in general. But when you're talking about Ford F-150 Lightnings, you're talking about Rivian pickup trucks, any e-truck or ESUV, you're looking at between 100 and 180 kilowatt hour batteries in these vehicles. So I'll let you do the rough math, but if you're charging 180 kilowatt hour battery pack with a three kilowatt AC charger, um, you're probably not, you know, it's going to take you 30 hours to charge, uh, right? So it's just like kind of ridiculous, right? I mean, we're not talking I mean, days and days to charge vehicles. So that's, that's, that's a non-starter. Then the opposite end, though, if we're trying to get electric vehicles adopted, particularly by fleets, because they, you know, pollute the most, because they have the most vehicles, um, the, this whole appetite for buying hundreds of thousands of dollars of charging infrastructure and putting it in is, is also a non-starter. Uh, so to just so what we said was well, no one's really focusing on the what we think is is the, the the right solution, which is what is the fastest, what is the cheapest you can charge DC fast charger vehicle, and let's make that, and that looks a lot like we thought between twenty and twenty five kilowatt DC fast charger, um, and then also it we wanted to bake in the kind of the modularity to be able to ramp up. So we use what we call a cassette model. So you can, you can have a 20, a 40, a 60, an 80, right? You just run them all in parallel. Um, so that's kind of what we, what we came up with. So there's, 
one way to think about it, the, the problem is this. So to do what our system can do right now, you buy a 20 to 25 kilowatt DC fast charger that costs that, that costs about twelve and a half thousand dollars. Again, all this is for commercial, but I'll get to I'll get to the pivot in a second. Then, if you want to buy, uh, you know, solar inverter, uh, the inverter for your battery, not the, obviously the battery itself, but just the inverter for the battery and a couple more systems to power electronic systems to balance everything out, you're looking at five systems at a cost of over twenty one thousand dollars. That twenty one thousand dollars does not cover, obviously, we know this, the cost of the solar the cost of the battery, the cost of the electric vehicle, none of that. Just in what did you see, the Boxo power electronics in front of you. So we thought, hey, this is pretty, you know, this is, we can do better, right? This is, this is not ideal. And we'll never achieve a more sustainable future as long as we're pricing most normal folks and small business owners from adopting, you know, clean energy technologies. So what we've done is we've put those five systems into one pretty small box uh, at about a third of the cost. And what you can do, what is this thing? It is first and foremost a 20 kilowatt DC fast charger. So you can charge two to five to 10 plus times faster than this normal slow AC plug. It's modular, stackable, so you can run multiple units in parallel to achieve an X rate faster charge. We went over that a little bit. Baked into this system, um, I say is a solar and battery inverter. Uh, there's certainly a solar inverter and the battery inverter is already part of the process, right? To be able to flip, uh, power whichever way you, it, it makes sense to go. So you can pull the solar on the roof of the small business or on a solar carport, route it through our box, keep it DC, go direct DC to the car battery. Go DC from solar through our system, right DC to a stationary storage battery. Go DC through our system, flip it to AC and push it to the grid. Um, pull energy from the grid, flip it to DC, push it to the car, push it to a battery, pull energy from the battery, push it to the car, push it to the grid. And then also supports kind of the full, the bi-directionality. This is the kind of the holy grail that I think there's a little bit of overhype on, which is the whole V to X vehicle to blank uh, concept, vehicle to home, vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to grid, but it can just kind of support all that. There's a kind of an interesting DOD application that we're working on right now with, uh, with the Department of the Army um, for their kind of efforts in electrifying which looks a lot like you can pull energy from a military electric vehicle, charge a military electric vehicle or pull on another one or char pull energy from a military electric vehicle, flip it to AC and then power an aid station or command and control node, blah, 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 blah. And I think they're pretty interested in that. Um, here's what I'm working on. And I'd love some kind of conversation at the end of this. So I'm just gonna, there's just two more slides. Um, this is what we're really excited about. And this is what I'm working on next week in LA. So we think we've figured out how to get solar DC fast charging for electric vehicles at or below grid parity, which has never happened before, ever, anywhere. So what we're trying to build, and we're very much, I mean, I'm literally flying out to look at sites and to talk about the technology a little bit more with, our, with, a, with a company out in LA called Hive. Drive Hive is the, the website, very interesting. The business model is, Let's give electric vehicles to the people who drive the most. Who drives the most? Gig economy drivers. Also, mostly low and middle income folks who don't have a place, who can't afford an electric vehicle and don't have a place to charge it because they don't have a garage to go home. And most folks don't have a garage to go home and charge it. In. So if you want to decarbonize transportation and you want to target the people who drive the most, the people who drive the most have the right now the shittiest vehicles, the most polluting vehicles because they're old, blah, 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 blah. And there's no place to charge it. So their entire business model is getting, in this case, right now it's bolts, Chevy bolts, um, getting bolts to gig economy drivers and actually having them make more money than they, than they have right now based on the, the vehicles that they're driving around right now. They're the clunkers that they're driving around right now. So that's their whole premise is let's get electric vehicles to the people who drive the most. That looks a lot like low and middle income gig economy drivers. And the problem that they had and why we got connected was they spent about six months arguing with all of the national charging infrastructure guys, ChargePoint, Electrify America, EVgo, blah, 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 blah. And they were trying to get them to come off their, their profit margins because they know that they're getting electricity from the grid at like 15 cents in California a kilowatt hour. And then they're charging 40, 50, 60 cents a kilowatt hour, right? And they're just making money kind of hand over fist. Uh, and they're like, hey guys, look what we're trying to do. We're not asking for charity, but like, can you come off of it a little bit? Can you do 30 cents or maybe a little bit better than that? And the, the answer for everybody was no. 
So they're like, screw it, we're gonna do our own charging network. We're gonna do our own charging. And that's where we got connected. Then when they found out that we could do solar and storage, that was pretty appealing. And it kind of puts this whole, not only are we gonna electrify the people who are polluting the most, but we're gonna also incorporate renewables into that process. Um, and what we're working on right now is, is doing the, the carbon payback. So right now, if you have, it's, it's to go carbon neutral for an electric vehicle. It depends on how much you drive and where your energy is generated from charging that vehicle. But it's about seven years on average um, for it to be, you know, for it to be uh, carbon neutral and start going back the other way. Uh, we think that we can get that down to one year doing this. So what this system is that we're designing, and we're very much in the design phase, so I'd love to kind of open up the conversation to the group, but we think it looks a lot like a solar canopy, probably 15 to 30 kilowatts, um, a battery pack. Now, the interesting thing with batteries, I can get batteries for a hell of a lot cheaper than anything that all of any of these guys are, are saying, right? So their typical battery consumer battery price is about 700 to $800 per kilowatt hour. Um, they're getting their batteries from for probably 150 or $200 a kilowatt hour to give you just an idea of how much money they're making um, direct from the, from the supplier, directly from China or South Korea. So we can do batteries for a hell of a lot cheaper than, than what anyone is gonna get downstream. Um, but to kind of push that a little even further, these bolts are getting in accidents about the national average every 100 or 150,000 miles. And many times it has nothing, I mean, it's not total, right? It's not bad accidents at all. It's minor little things. And they have a few bolt battery packs laying around. Um, so there's a conversation in this, we could go off on a tangent on the recall of the bolt and why that might not be a good idea right now. But the bigger, the bigger problem that's very interesting to solve is we think that there is a gap. We, the devil's in the details and the whole business model is based on finding this gap out. Mm -hmm. But there's a gap between the amount of energy that a car needs to use to move. Because right now it's it, an electric vehicle battery is put in a car, it's run, it degrades a little bit and can be refurbished. And then it gets degraded a little bit more. They pull it out and go directly to recycling it. So talking to all the guys in GM, I've had conversations with probably a couple dozen people at GM. That's the current way that this is done. Our thought is that there is some life, I don't know if it's a lot, I don't know if it's a little, but there is some life between when a battery is useful, no longer useful for a car, but very useful as a stationary storage application for a hell of a lot cheaper than you would buy a new battery. Obviously also more sustainable because you're not needing a new battery, you're using an old one. You're just extracting more life and more value out of the same battery pack. And you know, it will also always end in recycling. So the, the question is, is that is that hundreds of discharges? Is that thousands of discharges? Is that months? Is that years? What's the time gap? So that's another kind of thing that we're working on. Um, but if you combine solar and storage, particularly second life EV batteries, but that's kind of a longer term project, solar and storage, with DC fast charging and high levels of utilization, um, the maths for the first time ever starts to pencil out for, for being uh, kind of a profitable endeavor. And then the last thing we'll talk about. So when you create something that's an EV charger and this power electronic stuff, you kind of have a zebra crisis. Are you black with white stripes or white with black stripes? Are you a, are you a charger that does this other stuff or this other stuff that does a charger? So for us, um, this is meant to depict like what people are using this for. So first and foremost, if you want the most rudimentary level is you buy this system and you plug it into the grid. It's renewable ready because the ports are still there to incorporate solar and storage if you ever want to use it. But just doing that is already cheaper than a similar DC fast charger. Um, the second, utilize, second kind of level is solar plus grid. So this is a project that we're doing in Massachusetts State with, uh, in collaboration with Massachusetts State Government and, uh, and a company called ISUN out of Vermont. Um, that's solar canopy connected to the grid, DC fast charger. Then the, the ultimate use case, and this is what we're doing out in LA, is solar plus storage plus grid plus supercharging. So solar canopy connected to the grid, connected to batteries, connected in parallel to achieve that X rate faster charge. And that, and all three of those are like charger forward, if you will. And then 
The other side of this, and this is what we're working on with in a couple cities in Ohio, uh, but the biggest one is in Asheville, North Carolina and the University of North Carolina, Asheville. Um, they're interested in, they want solar and storage now, and they plan to completely electrify their university and government fleet over the next few years. So what they want to do with one shot, one kill is put the solar and battery inverter than now and have the baked in charger ready to rock and roll as their fleet kind of as their fleet starts to electrify. So it's like the other way of looking at this. And then the last thing that I'll say kind of down at the bottom, um, using almost exactly the same topology that we're using with the 20 kilowatt system, we can spin off a residential version of this. Uh, we can also go the other way. So we can also go to the 50 kilowatt system and, and operate on in larger chunks. So instead of 20, 40, 60, blah, 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 it's 50, 100, 150. So that's either faster charging or more likely the charging solution, modular charging solution for larger vehicles like ambulances and fire trucks, school buses and stuff like that. Um, and then we're working on one we think for the for the DOD that might be a little uh, might be a little special, but it, it it might be what we're one of the the 20s or the 50s or the 10s that we're rolling out right here. And that's it. All right, thanks, Tony. Um, one thing I was going to mention when you're doing that, how much capacity is left in the battery? I think it was around 10 years ago. I toured a um, AEP facility in Grove City, Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, just outside Columbus where they were doing that, they were taking old electric vehicles and using them as stationary backup for the grid. Um, and, and they may have some data, data that they may be willing to share, I don't know, about how quickly these degraded, how long they got out of the systems. Um, but it's worth checking if you haven't already. Sure, yeah, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's quite a few people, I mean, because everyone understands that this is kind of the holy grail. If you can extract a few thousand dollars uh, extra from every single EV battery, um, that in all, every major auto manufacturer in the world has said they will go mostly or entirely electric by 2035. Every single one. Um, and I think a lot of folks kind of talking with guys inside the industry right now, particularly at GM, they think that that timeline's too, too long. Um, because you're in the meantime, you have to split your supply chain you have to split your manufacturing capacity and you have to run dual tracks for the next 15 years. That's not tenable. So we'll either see, we'll either see a, a quicker adoption of the, a lot of these companies in, in making the transition to electric vehicles, or we'll see them go out of business because you can't, you can't survive that long. Yeah. I thought it was interesting. I was just doing today, some research on electric vehicles and uh, there was a projection. I don't know who made the projection. I think it was um, the department of energy they were hoping that by 2025, 20% of all new vehicles sold would be electric. And then I saw another article said in the first half of 2021, 26% of all vehicles were electric. Yeah, Jay, the, the, the most embarrassing analysis has ever occurred. Like if you ever want to just laugh at people who think that they're smart, like read any EV report by any McKinsey, JP Morgan, Deloitte, any of these people who are like industry experts and industry gods and anything, they've been embarrassingly wrong about everything as it relates to electrification. Yeah, EIA, EIA yes. is notorious for that. I, I saw yes. about two years ago, they were saying, you know, by 2025, 15% of the grid yep. would be electric. And the very same day it was announced, 17% of the grid in yep. the U.S. was was renewable. And you're yep. like, really, guys? Come yep. on. Yeah, no. A very common one was 30, 30% by 2030. And it's and it's it's kind of laughable right now. Yep. Yeah. So um, okay, anybody now my my understanding, your first step, you're saying just make a, a cheaper DC fast charger that fills that gap between the the cheapy ones, which is a, are AC based, and the very expensive ones they're putting in gas stations. And yep. you really think you can do that at about six thousand bucks for all the electronics? Yeah, so so we've we've uh, we've done this we've done this dance with several manufacturers and got a few quotes and we we're pretty confident that um, that we can offer it for that price point. Now, what will we what will we go to market at? I don't know, maybe 10k. Um, yeah. And then we, our our job we we have identified two main things. This is super nerdy, but the CCS controller, so to be able to do the communication with the car for the charging. 
Right now we're getting it from a German company for that control module. And that's like $1,500 itself. And then we have in our prototype, we've got this massive ass transformer that's used in like missile technology. So it's way overkill for what we needed. And that's about uh, over a thousand dollars. And neither of one of those, neither of those two things need to be that expensive. Um, so we'll probably do our own CCS controller and we'll probably do our own transformer. So what we'll probably do is offer it at ish 10 and then, which is still better than if you just bought a DC fast charger at 12 grand and then bake nope. everything else into it. Um, and then, and then we will work on making it cheaper for us to make and not increasing the cost of the system. Will Jay be able to hook up his Chevy Volt um, to that to that system? Uh, the Volt, <laughs> it'll be a little bit of overkill. Um, maybe the, we're working on the rich, really interesting one is the residential spinoff. So we've got a lot of interesting. Mm -hmm. We've got a lot of interest. So iSun, Sunrun, the U.S.'s largest residential solar installer, uh, Florida Power and Light. All of these cats are really interested in kind of collaborating to roll out um, the residential version of this. As an aside, a few months ago, Sun Power, multi-billion dollar solar company in the US, and Wallbox, multi-billion dollar electric vehicle charging company out of Barcelona, made this grand announcement that they were going to pair up and jointly develop a product that would better combine solar and storage and bi-directional EV charging and that it would come could come to a house near you in like 2023. Um, we could do that probably in three months. So um, that's a good validation of kind of where the market is headed uh, without kind of being sunk because if you know these guys figured figure this out, you know, three years ago, uh, we wouldn't, we'd be in a little bit more of a kind of a scary place. Well, it strikes me that the Chevy Lightning or the Ford Lightning um, is going to basically mandate, if they do what they're saying, that anyone who owns an EV wants to be able to use it to back up their house. You know, if that becomes a thing, everybody's going to say, well, why aren't you already doing this? Because they're doing it, but I yep. don't want to spend eighty thousand dollars on a pickup truck. Right. I want to. I want to use right. my Chevy Volt or my my Leaf or my whatever. So yes, um, is that something that is is a technological hurdle, or is that something that you're just like, yeah, 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 that gets baked in. Of course it does. Um, yeah, no, I think it's a great question. Uh, I, it's you don't build, so this is kind of nerd out a little bit on battery technology for a second. You don't build a battery. If you were told, give me a battery for a vehicle and give me a battery that sits on the ground for a home, that's not the same battery. You, you need to optimize. So in a car's case, it needs to be light and it needs to be able to output a tremendous amount of energy. Like 150 kilowatts is being expended when you're talking about you know putting the accelerator down on even like something like a bolt. Uh, it's an incredibly energy intensive process to move people and metal through time and space. That's not the case. And the opposite is almost the case with, with the stationary storage. You can, it's okay to have something heavy if it's in your, you know, your basement, hanging out in your basement. And you're also not going to need to discharge it anything close to 150 kilowatts at a time. So you optimize batteries based on what you're using it for. And that affects the cost. So I think there's a there's a lot of, there's too much hype on this whole vehicle to grid nonsense. I just think that that's kind of silly. Um, and I can tell you why. And then there's also, I think a little bit of overemphasis in using your car battery every single day to be the bat the energy storage for your home because it's not optimized to do the job that you want it to do. Emergencies, 100%. Sure, you need it for three days as, as Texas freezes over, uh, yeah cool. Um, but we're talking about every single day. No, because it's not, it just doesn't make economic sense. Um, because you're either going to discharge that for your home, or you're going to discharge that in miles driven. So you got to rob Peter to pay Paul at the end of the day anyway. Um, and the batteries are not designed to be plugged in to run a house every single day. Okay. Well, I know you guys are focused mostly on the residential. Well, I won't keep dominating. Jay, you had a question? Well, it's, it's just, I, I can't resist asking you a, a vehicle to grid question. Sure, please. All that. Yeah. But uh, 
every so often um, with my mother-in-law in a big uh, assisted living setting where in fact most people are independent in their condos and her little Elantra is sort of dwarfed by all the Lincolns and Cadillacs that are always sitting there, which tells me that lots of people with lots of money to spend have big cars they never drive. Yes. So is this a system where in a setting like that, where I don't know, I'm guessing it's over a hundred, but just say a hundred vehicles, any time at which, you know, only 5% are being driven, if every one of them had a connecting line and they could put into a computer that said, I need a full charge at 10 o'clock on Tuesday, you could be using this probably more, almost more as a storage base than as a driving base, but you're going to be really set up to do that and yeah. to really solve the problem of mass access. Yeah, correct. And is that, you? so you didn't say anything about apartment buildings and such, but it, these are the mass parkers instead of the mass users. Exactly. Yeah. The, the, the problem gets flipped when you're talking about uh, mass parkers. Now the, the, the holy grail fixer of that is autonomous vehicles, right? But I think that's one of those things where we're always five years away, always five years away. Mm -hmm. um, so for, for heavy parkers, I think that does make a little bit more sense. Where it gets tricky is the, it's, this is a painfully uh, kind of bougie term, but energy arbitrage, when you're talking about being able to, you've got to charge your electric vehicle battery at cheaper than you're selling it back to the grid. Who's, who's the arbiter of that process? Um, you know, in your, in your mom's case, is it, you know, somebody going out there in, in plugging their vehicle in during uh, 4 p.m. so that they can completely drain their battery uh, during peak hours from 4 to 7 p.m. And then in two in the morning, it gets drip recharged at night. Yeah, that's, that's, that's possible. Wow. Okay. Um, but it's, 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 it's complicated, right? I mean, it's like, is, is someone, is someone going to go do that? Because dollars and cents wise, it does make sense to do it um, because the energy prices are different. You can recharge more or for less than what you're charging to discharge it at peak hours. But who, who knows that who's going to go out there and make sure that they're, you know, plugged in, make sure that that process is happening. Cause as you guys know, you know, energy is consumed a second, less than a second after it's generated. So when we're talking about like, oh, there's a lot of demand on the grid. Well, there's no, what's the mechanism to make literally split second decisions It's just difficult. I, I'm just going to speculate that I don't think any of this will work until somebody can pull in, plug in the car and forget about it until 10 days later when they drive it again and let, let your computers do all that arbitrage. Yeah, it, it's the only way to do it. It's the only, you got to take, you got to minimize the person in the loop. Well, I've, I've, I've talked to some people at uh, airports, um, long-term parking with covered parking, solar canopies, and that exact thing where, you know, a guy plugs in when his arrival time is, when his departure time is, and you get free charging. Um, plus it keeps your vehicle, you know, in Northern climates over the winter, it'll keep it warm, um, keeps it covered. And those airports, then their parking becomes an energy generating facility. Um, but I also think with the vehicle to grid, most people think of it as a, you know, UPS kind of thing. When the power goes out, I'm going to use it to back up. But in right. the commercial world, you've got, you know, load shifting and, and uh, time of day pricing issues and demand charge issues. And just the fact that you could even out demand charges in an industrial or commercial could, could of course, pay for your system right away just simply right. by drawing on the entire parking of all the employees. You know, they're not leaving until five. You can just keep their batteries right. dead until five o'clock, yep. you know, and, yep. and right. then they can't leave, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and some people would be better positioned than, than others. Like Jay, when we were down, um, you know, the if, especially if you provide electric vehicles to all of your employees. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like, hey guys, we're going to use their car as a battery real quick. Yeah, the facility we had the class at was MeLink. And uh, they're a solar and, and uh, energy company down there in near Cincinnati. And they do provide almost all their vehicles, all their employees with electric vehicles. And they had solar canopies and charging stations at pretty much almost every single parking space. And uh, it's quite a, quite a thing. So 
Okay, I think, um, I don't know, anybody else, anything else? We're gonna be running out of time here, but- uh, Kelly, um, just a question. Sure. Uh, more of a business than a technical question. If you're selling this to primarily people like smaller businesses and eventually individuals, are you going to have them finance too? I mean, a lot of the big banks now are not going to finance or moving out of other energy, other oil and gas. Yeah, no, that's a great question, Don. And they, um, it makes them look good too. Yeah, right. Uh, the short answer is probably. Right mm -hmm. now we're trying to, right now we've got a few like real big partners, like multi-billion dollar companies who are interested in either the residential, the 20 or the 50. I, mean, we, mm -hmm. I can pair every single one of those with one or more kind of real heavy 800 pound gorilla. Um, so that's kind of a good way to start. And then as it kind of shakes out, we'll see, because like in my ideal scenario, you want to, mm -hmm. as, a, as a technology provider, producer, I would ideally just want to deal with a sun run. Mm -hmm. And then, right. Um, now, there's advantages to not doing that, right? But uh, agreed. But GE made all their money off of GE Finance, not off correct. of GE products. Correct. Yeah. No. There's absolutely a there's absolutely a huge draw to be able to do this because I think I think that's the name of the game, especially with you know kind of normal folks who want to do the right thing. There's mm -hmm. not there's not yeah. a great financial model to do that right now, and that's absolutely mm -hmm. something that we can solve. Mm -hmm. Anybody, Anybody else? else? Yeah. Yeah, did Anybody? you guys hear that Hertz ordered a hundred thousand Model Threes yeah. from Tesla? Yes. Yep. <laughs> That's yep. four billion, four billion dollars, and Tesla's value went up over a trillion dollars yeah. as a result. Yeah, my uh, my Tesla stock's doing really well. Uh, yeah. it's, it's weird, yeah. right? Because the Tesla stock barely jumps when they sell out. Oh yeah. They're 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 wise in Q3. That, oh, wait, sorry, no more Teslas today, or for the rest of the year. That's <laughs> then the, the stock price doesn't change. But if they sell a hundred thousand cars to Hertz. Um, over the course of however many years, then your stock price goes nuts. I mean, this is just a wacky world where we're living in. Well, it was funny. The last time I was in MeLink before this this most recent time, everybody was driving a Chevy Volt. And now this time, everybody had uh, Teslas, you know, yeah. which was yeah. clearly a change in the, in the market. So, all right. Well, uh, thanks, Tony. And I know you join in most weeks, so we can, we can keep picking your brain. And if anybody yeah, has definitely. any ideas uh, for Tony about issues they see we'll just keep feeding those to you but uh, fantastic thanks guys i appreciate, appreciate it. it all right well i'll see you guys uh all next week all right take care thank you